God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. So as I begin this message here this morning, I'd actually like to tell you a story about a mother. Uh, her name was Monica. And Monica has a story that is similar to many in the fact that as, as Monica was growing and, and going through her maturing process, she looked forward to being married and having children, and, and that actually came to be for Monica. Uh, she did marry a man, but as, you know, as, as time approached the wedding, it became clear to Monica that this person who was going to be her husband didn't share her faith, didn't share her perspective on Christian faith. And so even at the wedding, she was you know, hoping for the best, but recognizing that there was something that was different between them. And not only that, that wasn't the only difference, but as time went by and in their marriage, then she also discovered that sometimes her husband could be kind and, and, uh, and sweet and caring, and other times he could be harsh and cruel and disrespectful. And, well, Monica was never quite sure what was going to happen or how her husband might respond to her, so she was always a little bit on edge, but you know, still kind of hoping for the best, until ultimately um, her husband had an affair. And so this has been Monica's marriage relationship, one of some trials and suffering and heartache. Not only did that happen in Monica's life, but they, you know, she and her husband did have three kids. And as it would be, it happens so often in families, while of the three kids, two seemed to be doing okay, the, there was that third one who really tested her. And he was the one who would get into trouble and, and actually ch make some choices that were shameful. Shameful for him, but also shameful for the family. And while she tried to raise her children, maybe even sometimes feeling like a single mom in the process, she over and over again tried to instill in her children the Christian faith and nurture their faith in Christ. So when this third son was causing such great grief, rebelling and disrespecting, disrespecting and even sometimes being spiteful, the thing that caused her the most grief was his rejection of the faith, the rejection of the Christian faith and faith in Jesus Christ himself. So Monica's heart was broken. She suffered heartache and grief and pain for many years. And while she continued to try and nurture the faith of her children, the other thing she tried to do was pray. To pray consistently for the faith of her husband and the faith of her children. And she prayed. Now, this, is a, this may sound like a fairly common story. right? You may know someone who has endured these kinds of hardships. You may have been someone who have endured these kinds of hardships. The thing I need to let you know is that Monica lived in the fourth century. And Monica, the son that was so rebellious to her and rejected the Christian faith for so long, was actually St. Augustine. And so as Monica continued to live out her faith in the presence of her son and nurture his faith and pray for him, Monica had the joy of seeing her son return to the faith. And, as I just mentioned, not only to return to the faith, but become a stalwart promoter of the faith and his faith in Jesus Christ. Let me be clear, though. I am not trying to tell you this morning that Monica was a perfect mother. And, or nor, nor am I going to say that Naomi was a perfect mother. And neither am I going to say that we should try and live up to these kinds of standards. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying and what I think the scriptures from Ruth chapter 1 are going to reveal to us is that there are some points for each one of us to ponder. That there are some, going to be some opportunities for each one of us to reflect upon. Both for us, ourselves, and for others. And ultimately, it will be an opportunity for us to believe and an opportunity for us to long for others to believe. And so in light of that, I have four points that we'll walk through this morning. Again, as we just see how these situations of Naomi and her daughters-in-law, Ruth and Orpah, 
what they lived through and how they lived through them, what insights and opportunities there might be for us to believe. So our first point is a desire to be part of good things. A desire to be part of good things. Now, as we had a great chuckle, I think, at least it sounded like there was a good chuckle over that opening video, and you have the dad working the football with his son over and over again, but mom gets all the kudos at the, at the national championships. And you may have thought, Jim chose the wrong, that's in June. You know, Father's Day is in June. Well, you might have that first initial response to this next illustration I'm going to share with you. You're going to say, really? You chose that illustration on Mother's Day? But trust me, just for a minute, and I think there's a really meaningful moment in it. Because here's the illustration. It comes from Rocky, the second movie. Now, <laughs> you may have thought, really, on Mother's Day. But anyway, hang with me for just a minute. Rocky, in the second movie, he's already gone through the first fight of his life. He lost, but now the second movie, he's trying to engage in a life with his new bride and, by the way, their new son. So there is that Mother's Day aspect to Rocky. But anyway, so but he's trying to do a different kind of life. He's not going to be a boxer anymore. He's not going to be in the ring. He's not going to do those things. But you get to this pivotal point in the movie where Rocky is now questioning this ability to live this new life. And he really longs to be back in that boxing environment, back at the gym, back in the ring. He really wants to go do that kind of thing. So he calls up. He goes and visits his manager and trainer, Mickey, and says, hey, Mickey, you know, I thought I retired. I thought it would work out okay, but I just I want back in. And Mickey, in a very poignant way, proves to him and tries to communicate to him that he is not going back in the ring, that that is not available to him anymore. And he says, no, Rocky, you're done. No hope for you. And this is the line that I want to really emphasize. Is Rocky says, can I at least come to the gym and sweep? Can I take out the trash? Can I empty water buckets? Can I, I just need to be there. I need to be around it. I need to be near it. If it's not for me anymore, can you at least let me be in it, around it? And I really think that that's what Naomi is saying. Listen again to these words from Ruth. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So this is happening during the times of the judges, when other nations are continually oppressing and battling and overtaking Israel. And they were living in that opposition and, and uh, subjection for years. And so, Naomi and her husband and her sons, they had left Jerusalem. They had left the land of Judah to try and find another place to live. They landed in Moab. But now, Naomi is saying, but I hear that God is doing good things back at home. And while she says, I don't think there's anything good left for me. You heard her say those painful words, right? No hope for me. In fact, she's convinced that God won't do anything good for her. Maybe even believes that God is punishing her for something. Something in her past. And so she says, I know there's no hope for good things in my life. But I just have to be near it. I have to be around it. I have to be where God is doing good things. And so she's going to head back home. So that was Rocky's phrase, right? I at least, can I at least be around it? Now, if you know the story, Rocky ends up getting back in the ring and surprisingly wins the championship and everything's great. But is Naomi going to have that same kind of an outcome? Well, what happens in Naomi's life, right? She says, I, I have to at least be around the good things that God is doing. And what ends up happening for her? She holds a grandson. And who is her grandson? None other but the grandfather of King David. And so Naomi, her belief, her heart's desire was to be where God is doing good things. And in the end, she does experience those good things. She does experience God's grace and mercy in her life. So the first point for us to reflect on, the first opportunity to ponder, is that we can believe that God is doing good things. Especially 
when it may not be easy to perceive them in our own lives. Even during those times, and I, like I said, even especially maybe when it's difficult to perceive good things in our own life, just na na like Naomi, having a hard time perceiving that God was doing good things in her life, she believed God was doing good things. And so she wanted to be where God was doing good things. Which brings us to the second point, now a desire for the demonstration of kindness. Listen to what she says. Go, return each of you to her mother's house, and may the Lord deal kindly with you. May the Lord deal kindly with you. You see, Naomi and Ruth, in the context of their culture and the circumstances of their life, they were utterly dependent on other people for their provision, for their life you know, protection. They were dependent on others. They did not have the ability to go out and find employment or choose to make a, a place to live for themselves. They were dependent upon society or people within the society to take care of them. And listen to what Naomi says. She says, I need, to, I need you to go back to your mother's house because I have nothing. I have nothing to offer you. So at least maybe go back to your own mother's house because my desire for you is that you would experience kindness. That you would know kindness. Well, Ruth, as you heard, goes with Naomi and they go back to the land of Judah. And so Ruth ends up in the fields because the only way widows could find sustenance was to go out into the fields after the harvesters and glean what was left over and left behind. And what I marvel at is right here, just in this short amount of time, we see how God answers Naomi's prayer for kindness to be shown to Ruth, for a demonstration of kindness. Because as she is in this field, she is now the newcomer. And believe you me, when one more person comes into the field to start gleaning and picking up what everybody else is scrambling for, the newcomer is not welcome. They are the outsider, the outcast. They will get pushed to the outskirts of the field. They will not be allowed to glean where it might maybe the best. And so you have Ruth now in this situation and a Moabite, right? She's a foreigner who has now shown up in the field to glean, still with nothing. And she is at risk of harm. We see this later on when Boaz, the owner of the field she goes to, tells the foreman of the job, says, make sure you protect her. Make sure you make no harm can come to her from anyone else. And so here they are in this situation, desperate and in need of both provision and protection. And we see the answer of Naomi's prayer for kindness because Boaz does give her protection. And he does make provision for them. In fact, he says to the foreman, wherever Ruth is picking up, wherever she's gleaning, make sure the harvesters leave extra. Make sure that they don't pick up everything and so that Ruth can come along and get larger quantities. So first he protects her and then he gives special provision for her and he shows her undeserved favor. Ruth didn't necessarily deserve all this. She hadn't earned it. It wasn't based on performance. But Boaz shows her unmerited favor and kindness. And so... It is a great, I, I think, as believers in Christ, I think we're all called to show kindness to others. But there is no greater act of kindness than to ask God to show someone kindness. There is no greater act of kindness than to pray and ask God to show kindness in their life. That great unselfish act to say to God Almighty, please show that person kindness. As God's people, let's make it our practice to show kindness. But when we can, let's ask the one who is greatest at showing kindness to offer it to them. So first, let's desire to be around good things. And then let's desire for a demonstration of kindness. And then the next point, a desire for the giving of rest. Naomi goes on and says that the Lord may grant you or that you may find rest. I've hinted at this already. It's been a long hard road for Naomi and her daughters-in-law. A hard road of death of her own husband, death of her sons. It's been a life that has been filled with pain. 
a life that has been characterized by suffering, fear, and loneliness. As I know, as I know many of you have experienced similar things in your own journey, in your own life story, things that have led to fear and worry, loneliness, and doubt. So where, where will this rest come from? Because that's what Naomi is saying. She longs for her daughters-in-law to experience rest from all the pain and suffering and grief that they have experienced. Well, it comes from the man named Boaz who God placed in Ruth's life, the owner of that field. And Boaz occupies the position of what we understand from the Scriptures to be the kinsman redeemer, a relative who steps in to rescue a relative who steps in to redeem. And in the culture and in the context, what took place was that if, the, if Boaz would purchase the land that still belonged to the family, even though Ruth and Naomi couldn't have it, he could purchase it. And in so doing, provide and redeem and give security to Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi. And not only that, to make them members of his family, his household. So in the, in the end of the story, he marries Ruth. And she becomes his wife, and, she, and he grants her security and provision and inheritance. Just as we who believe in Jesus Christ have become co-heirs with Christ, and we have an inheritance in heaven. And so who gives this rest? Where does this rest come from? Well, for Ruth, it came from Boaz, but he is the foretaste of Jesus Christ himself. Because ultimate rest, ultimate rest that come from, from the grief and the hardships of this life come from Jesus Christ. True rest is a gift from God. And I repeat to you the words from Jesus Christ when he said, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. True rest comes from God. It is a gift from Him to us. So we see, even from the story of Naomi and Ruth, that it is good to want to be where God is doing His good things. And it is good to have a desire for others to know His kindness. And it is good for others to, to long for others to find rest. Rest from the burdens of this life. Rest from the burdens of sin known through the forgiveness and love and grace of God. Our fourth point is it, also, it is also good to have a desire for the expression of love. The expression of love. Notice it's repeated for us twice. It says that Naomi kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. This authentic expression of love proves its genuineness. It wasn't just that Naomi said, I love you, see ya. It was weeping and, and a kiss and an embrace. It was authentic expression that proved its genuineness. And it's both and. When I say both and, I mean it's, it's the cognitive choice to love. And we see in the pages of Scripture from the earliest chapters of Genesis to the last chapters of Revelation that God chooses to love us over and over again. As I've said, it's unmerited. We haven't earned it. It's not based on our performance. God chooses to love us. And then He has demonstrated it to us in authentic expressions that include emotions and motivation and of course, ultimate demonstrations through His Son, Jesus Christ. His death and His resurrection as expressions of His love for us. Including that sometimes I'm convinced that God grieves. Grieves for those who are still living in rebellion and rejecting His faith. Rejecting the faith that the Holy Spirit is working in them. At the same time, I know that all of heaven rejoices when one person responds to Christ in faith. And so on both ends of the, at, at the spectrum, God expresses His love for us, sometimes with grief and sometimes 
with joy. It is always an authentic expression of God's love for you and for me. Which I'm convinced is why John writes in his letter, 1 John 3, verse 18, don't love just with words, but also with deeds and in truth. Authentic expressions of love from our Father in heaven. So as we conclude these thoughts this morning, hopefully you've had an opportunity to ponder. An opportunity for faith and to believe. And maybe the conclusions that you've come to are about longing to be where God is doing His good work and believing that God is doing His good work and longing for kindness in the lives of others as you, by faith, receive God's kindness in your own life and, and being grateful for the rest that God has given to us through His Son, Jesus Christ and longing and praying for that rest to be realized by others and ultimately in the end as those who have received the expression of God's love, that we would long for others to also be able to receive His expression of love for them. To God be the glory. Amen.